In previous tutorials, we've hard-coded vertex data directly into our vertex shader. However, this is clearly not a feasible solution for drawing anything remotely complicated. 3D models for modern games typically have thousands of triangles, if not more. So in this tutorial, we will cover how vertex buffers store data and can be bound to graphics pipelines. A vertex buffer is really just a chunk of memory that we pass into our vertex shader. We can put whatever data we would like into this memory, as long as we tell our graphics pipeline how it is structured. The first way we structure this data is by grouping it into attributes. A vertex attribute is just an input variable that is specified on a per vertex basis. So for example, we could create a vertex attribute for our two-dimensional position. If this was our only vertex attribute, then our vertex buffer would look like this, where every two numbers are grouped together to make up the x and y position of our vec2 input variable. Now, let's say we want to specify an RGB color for each vertex. We could add a second vertex attribute, this time a vec3. If we add this to our vertex buffer, then our buffer would look like this. The first two values in the buffer are grouped together to make up the position attribute for the first vertex. The next three values are the red, green, and blue values. These will be grouped together to form the color attribute. The next five values are used for the second vertex and so on. The other way this data can be structured is by grouping attributes into separate bindings. For example, if we add a third attribute, we could interleave all three attributes into a single binding, or have one binding per attribute. Really, any combination we would like. For each binding, we need to provide a vertex binding description at pipeline creation. In the description, we need to specify the binding index, the input rate, and the stride. We can mostly ignore input rate. For now, this will always be input rate vertex with the alternative being input rate instance for when working with instanced data. The stride specifies the interval in bytes from one entry to the next. So you can imagine a pointer at the start of a vertex buffer. The stride indicates how many bytes it needs to advance each time to get to the start of the next vertices data. For each attribute, we must provide a vertex attribute description. Attribute descriptions need four pieces of information the binding index for the vertex buffer the attribute is located in, the location value for the input in the vertex shader, the offset of the attribute in bytes from the vertex start, and a VK format value describing the type of data. For example, our color attribute could be in our first buffer at binding index 0, and the location we specified in the vertex shader is location 1. The offset would be 8 because the position has 4 bytes for the X component plus another 4 bytes for the Y component. Therefore, the color attribute values start at an offset of 8 bytes from the start of the vertex data. And finally, the format specifies the data type of the attribute. So the color attribute is a VEC3, which corresponds to VK format R32, G32, B32, S float. These are some commonly used data types and formats. Note that even though the format implies a color-like structure, we use the same format even if we are representing non-color data. For example, the VEC2 position attribute would still use a VK format R32G32S float, even though it's not a color. So far, I've been using binding and buffer interchangeably, which might imply that for each binding we have a separate buffer but typically you will want to minimize the amount of memory allocations. So often for something like vertex data, even if we have multiple bindings, we will only allocate one large vertex buffer and have each binding map to a different region of the same buffer. So is it better to use a single interleaved binding or one binding per attribute or something in between? I won't delve into this topic too much right now as performance differences tend to be modest anyway, and there is no one right answer. Typically, a single interleave binding would be the recommended way to go. And for simpler pipelines and basic algorithms, this is usually true. However, depending on your overall rendering pipeline, the algorithms being used, and even your specific hardware, 
using separate buffers may yield better performance. So for now, don't worry about it. Just keep this in the back of your mind that in the future, if you're working on some specific rendering implementation and need to squeeze every millisecond of performance out, that restructuring your vertex data may be beneficial. Okay, let's get to coding. The first thing we're going to do is create a new header file for our model class. So I'm going to call my file lve underscore model dot hpp. I'll use pragma once to create a header guard and then add the LVE namespace I've been using. Then make a new class LVE model within the namespace. So the purpose of this class is to be able to take vertex data created by or read in a file on the CPU and then allocate the memory and copy the data over to our device GPU so it can be rendered efficiently. So like with most of the other classes we've created so far, we need a device reference to work with it. So create a private LVE device reference variable called LVE device. And at the top of the file, add an include for LVE device. Next, add three more private variables, VK buffer, vertex buffer, VK device memory, vertex buffer memory, and a uint32 type, vertex count. Moving on, for the public portion of the model class, I'm going to go to my first app header and just copy these four lines, paste them in, and replace the class name with LVE model. We must delete the copy constructors because the model class manages the Vulkan buffer and memory objects. Now take notice that for buffer objects in Vulkan, the buffer and its assigned memory are two separate objects. Rather than memory being automatically assigned for the buffer, this puts us, the programmer, in control of memory management. Now add a public function, void bind, that takes a vk command buffer as the argument, then duplicate this line and rename the second function to draw. Now jumping over to the vertex shader, First, completely remove the hard-coded positions variable. We're going to replace this with layout bracket location equals zero, closing bracket in vec2 position. So here we've specified our first vertex attribute. Like before, the data type is still a vec2, but note that now we have this in keyword that signifies that this variable takes its value from a vertex buffer. The layout location sets the storage of where this variable value will come from. This is how we connect the attribute description to the variable we mean to reference in the shader. And now replace positions at GL vertex index with just position. We don't need to use GL vertex index anymore because the position attribute will automatically be set with the values from the vertex buffer. So remember that the vertex shader runs once for each vertex we provide, and each time this position variable will contain a different x and y component from the vertex buffer. And that's it for the vertex shader. Back in the model header, we are going to create a representation of our vertex attributes that's easy to work with. First, let's include the vector library glm. You should have already downloaded this and connected it to your project way back in tutorial one, when we also set up glfw for windowing. Just above the include for glm, add the line define glm force radians. This makes sure that no matter what system you're on, the glm functions will expect angles to be specified in radians, not degrees. Back in university, in a computer graphics course, I must have wasted two hours debugging an assignment because I was thinking in degrees when I should have been working in radians. Don't make the same mistake. Additionally, add a define glm force depth 0 to 1. This will affect some glm functions we will eventually use. This tells glm to expect our depth buffer values to range from 0 to 1, opposed to negative 1 to 1, which is, if I'm remembering correctly, what OpenGL uses. So now, just underneath the public annotation in the model class, create a struct vertex. So for now, all we have is a glm vec2 position. 
also add a static function std vector angle bracket vk vertex input binding description closing bracket get binding descriptions function and then also include vector at the top of the file copy this line and paste it to add a second function but this time it will be get attribute descriptions and instead return vk vertex input attribute description type Oh, and these should be descriptions with an S. Then add a private function, void create vertex buffers. That takes a const standard vector reference of type vertex vertices argument. Now, finally, for our header, update the model class constructor to take a LVE device reference device and const standard vector vertices reference as arguments. Okay, now let's add our implementation. Create a new file, lve underscore model dot cpp, and then include the model header and add your namespace. Copy your constructor signature and the destructor and paste them in. Add your class name scope and then initialize the device member variable. LVE device curly brace device. For the constructor body, just call create vertex buffers and pass through the vertices argument. Next, add the class name scope to the destructor. And for the destructor body, we have VK destroy buffer, LVE device dot device, vertex buffer, and null pointer for our allocation callback. Then VK free memory LVE device dot device vertex buffer memory and null pointer. Okay, let's quickly talk about these allocation callbacks that we've routinely passed null pointers to. So we've seen that Vulkan lets us manage our buffers and memory separately. And the main reason for this is that allocating memory takes time and there's a hard limit to the total number of active allocations that varies by GPU, typically only in the thousands though. So if we continue on as we have been, as soon as you want to create a scene of high complexity with many different types of models, this model class will quickly run into those max allocation limits. So the recommended solution is to allocate bigger chunks of memory and assign parts of them to particular resources. So just for the short term, to demonstrate and learn the basics of memory allocation, we will continue to do so manually. But I think eventually we will integrate a well-established allocator library like VMA. If you would like to read about what might go into creating a memory allocator yourself, I've provided a link to a blog post by Kyle Halliday where he does just that. Now moving on, let's implement the create vertex buffers function. Grab the function signature, add your class name scope, and then in the function body, the first thing we'll do is set the vertex count member variable to static cast uint32 type vertices.size. Now let's add an assertion that the vertex count is at least three so that we know our model class consists of at least one triangle. So first include C assert and then add assert vertex count is greater than or equal to three with the label vertex count must be at least three. Next, create a local variable of type VK device size called buffer size equal to size of vertices index zero times the vertex count. So the size of operator returns the number of bytes required per vertex. And then multiplying by the vertex count gives us the total number of bytes required for our vertex buffer to store all the vertices of the model. Next, we're going to call the create buffer function. This is a helper function I wrote that is in the LVE device class. Let's go over this now. So the create buffer function takes the buffer's size, usage, and properties as arguments, and then returns a buffer and its associated memory by initializing the buffer and buffer memory references. This code here should seem somewhat familiar. We have a create info struct where we set some members such as the size and how we plan to use this buffer, and then call a vkCreate function. 
We then query the buffer's memory requirements so that we can allocate memory of the proper size that also has the required properties that we specified as an argument. Finally, if that was successful, we bind the buffer to the memory we just allocated. Eventually, we will have to rewrite this function once we integrate a memory allocator. Okay, so back in our create vertex buffers function, we have our buffer size, so now call LVE device dot create buffer. The first argument is the buffer size, then next we have VK buffer usage vertex buffer bit. This just tells our device that we want to create a buffer that is going to be used to hold vertex input data. Following that, we need to specify our memory properties with VK memory property host visible bit and VK memory property host coherent bit. So make sure to use the bitwise or operator here, which combines the bit flags together. The host visible bit memory property tells Vulkan that we want the allocated memory to be accessible from our host, aka the CPU. This is necessary for our host to be able to write to the device memory. The host coherent memory property keeps the host and device memory regions consistent with each other. If this property is absent, then we are required to call VK flushed mapped memory ranges in order to propagate changes from host to device memory. Then the final two arguments are the vertex buffer and vertex buffer memory member variables. Now finally declare a local variable void pointer data. Then call VK map memory LVE device dot device vertex buffer memory zero as the offset buffer size, then zero for not providing any VK memory mapped flags, and finally a pointer to data. This function creates a region of host memory mapped to device memory and sets data to point to the beginning of the mapped memory range. Then next we need to use the memcopy function. So first include C string, then call memcopy data vertices.data static cast size t buffer size. And finally, call VK unmap memory LVE device dot device vertex buffer memory. So memcopy takes the vertices data and copies it into the host mapped memory region. Now, because we have this host coherent bit, the host memory will automatically be flushed to update the device memory. If this bit is absent, we'd be required to call VK flush mapped memory ranges in order for the changes to propagate. Okay, now the draw function implementation is very simple. Copy and paste the function signature and add the class name scope. Then inside the body, just call VK command draw, command buffer vertex count, and then one for instance, zero for first vertex index, and zero for first in uh, first instance index, and that's it. The bind function is pretty similar. Copy and paste the function signature and add the class name scope. Make a local variable vk buffer buffers array equal to curly braces vertex buffer, and then vk device size offsets array equal to curly braces zero. Then just call vk command bind vertex buffers, command buffer, first binding at zero, binding count of one, then buffers and offsets. So this function will record to our command buffer to bind one vertex buffer starting at binding zero with an offset of zero into the buffer. And when we eventually might want to add multiple bindings, we can easily do so by adding additional elements to these arrays. Next, let's implement the get binding descriptions function. For its scope, we have LVE model scope, then vertex scope get binding descriptions. Make a vector VK vertex input binding description local variable binding descriptions of size one. Then binding descriptions index zero dot binding equals zero. Then dot stride equals size of vertex. and uh, dot input rate equals VK vertex input rate vertex. Then return the binding description. Alternatively, if you prefer, you can just use a brace construction, but I've done it this way to make the code more readable. 
So this binding description corresponds to our single vertex buffer. It will occupy the first binding at index 0. The stride advances by size of vertex bytes per vertex. Now finally, for get attributes descriptions, copy the function signature and add your model and vertex scopes. Don't forget to remove the static keyword. So similarly, create a local variable with type vector of VK vertex input attribute descriptions called attribute descriptions. Then attributes index zero dot binding equals zero. Next dot location equals zero. This corresponds to the location specified in the vertex shader. Next dot format equals VK format R32 G32 S float. This specifies the data type that we have uh, two components that are each 32 bit signed floats. Finally, dot offset equals zero and return attribute descriptions. Next, we need to provide our pipeline with these descriptions so it actually knows how to read our vertex buffer data. First, we need to include our model class. Now, currently in our create graphics pipeline function, our vertex input info struct was pretty much empty. Start by adding two local variables. Auto binding descriptions is equal to LVE model vertex get binding descriptions. And auto attribute descriptions is equal to LVE model vertex get attribute descriptions. Then update the attribute description count to equal static cast uint32 type attributes.size. and binding description count to equal to static cast uint32 type binding descriptions.size. Then set pvertex attribute descriptions to attributes descriptions.data and pvertex binding descriptions to binding descriptions.data. Now all that's left to do is create an instance of our model and draw it. So open your first header, include LVE model, and then create a LVE model unique pointer LVE model. Then add a private load models function. Now in the first app implementation file, implement the function void first app load models. Inside its body, create a vector of type LVE model vertex, and we will use this to initialize the vertex data positions. So I'm going to use the same positions values we had before of 0, negative 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and negative 0.5, 0.5. Make sure to get your braces correct here. We have three levels. The outermost initializes the vector, then we initialize each model vertex, and then the innermost braces initialize the GLM VEC2 position member. Next, initialize the model with LVE model equals STD make unique LVE model with LVE device as the first argument and vertices as the second. Then in your first app constructor, call the load models function as the first line. Then in the create command buffers function, remove the command draw function call and add LVE model arrow bind command buffers at index i and LVE model arrow draw command buffers at index i. And that's it. Our command buffer in each render pass will bind our graphics pipeline, then bind our model which contains the vertex data, and then record a command buffer to draw every vertex contained by the model. Now build and run, and okay, I've done something wrong. It's an easy fix. I swapped the names of the bind and draw functions. Also make sure that your vertex shader has been recompiled if you haven't set it to automatically do so. If I fix that and now build and run, our familiar triangle appears. But what's different this time is that the vertex positions are no longer hard coded into the vertex shader. Finally, as a completely optional exercise, now that we can provide any position data we want, See if you can create something like the Sierpinski triangle that's displayed in the tutorial's thumbnail. You will probably want to create a recursive function that generates a vector list of vertices. Every three vertices forms the next triangle. Then initialize your model with that vertex list. I've included a link to my solution in the video's description. 
And that's it for today. We can now pass in a non-fixed amount of position data. In the next video, we will add an additional color attribute and show how to pass data from the vertex shader to the fragment shader. Thanks for watching and see you next time.